Let me check. Live from San Francisco, it's the Cube covering Red Hat Summit 2018. Brought to you by Red Hat. Hey, welcome back everyone. We are live here with theCUBE in San Francisco, Moscone West, for Red Hat Summit 2018. I'm John Furrier, the co-host of theCUBE, with John Troyer, co-host analyst this week, with Tech Reckoning co-founder. Our next two guests are Ashesh Bandi, and Vice President, General Manager of OpenShift Platform, and Alex Holvey, CEO of CoreOS, uh, interview of the week, because CoreOS, now part of Red Hat. Congratulations, good to see you again. Thanks for coming on theCUBE, thanks for... Sure. So I'll see, this is, you know, for us, we've been covering you know, both of you guys pretty heavily, and I've, we've been commenting you know, very positively around the acquisition of CoreOS. Two great companies that know open source, you know, pure open source, okay? You guys got the business model nailed down, these guys got great tech, you bring it together. So the first question is, you know, how's everyone doing, how's everyone feeling, and where's the overlap, if any, and where's the fit? Explain the, the true fit of CoreOS. So why don't I start, Alex, if you want to jump in after? Um, we're very excited, right? So when we um, first had interactions with CoreOS, you know, we knew this was going to be a great fit, right? The conversation we had earlier, um, both companies believers in open source, believers in the mission you know, to, to uh, take us forward with regard to Kubernetes as the container orchestration engine and then being able to build out value for customers around it. Um, I think from our perspective, you know, the work that both CoreOS did in advancing the community forward, but also the work they've done around you know, automation, over the air upgrades, uh, management, metering, chargeback, and so on, being able to bring all those qualities into Red Hat uh, is incredible. So I think the fit's been uh, good, it's been three months, I'll let Alex comment some more on that, but you know, we've been doing a lot of work from, from an integration perspective, around engineering, around product management. Um, at Red Hat Summit this week, we've revealed uh, details around some of the Converge roadmap, which I can talk about some more as well. Um, so we're feeling pretty good about it. Alex, your, your reaction? Yeah, so it's been three months. Um, <laughs> As if you've studied uh, CoreOS at all, you know kind of everything that we do really centers around this concept of automated operations. And so by being part of Red Hat, we're really starting to bring that to market in a much bigger and faster way, we're really accelerating it. I mean, the, the way the acquisitions are really successful is if you know, they're mutually beneficial to both companies and they accelerate you know, the adoption of technology, and that's definitely happening. We had the announcement yesterday with Red Hat Core OS around the Linux distribution. Last week we did the operator framework, which was very central to the, the work that we've been doing as part of Core OS. And then you know, as companies, in a lot of ways, now part of being part of uh, Red Hat for three months now, it's just you know, like this is what you know, our company would have looked like if we were just you know, another 10 years along or whatever, very similar. We're like a mini Red Hat, and now we were just leaped ahead in a big way. Right. And you, know, you, guys, you guys have done the good work. We've documented on theCUBE many times. We were in Copenhagen, uh, Copenhagen last week with the, uh, now covering the operator framework. But I want to get your reaction, because you guys did a lot of great work on the tech side. Obviously, it's documented. You can, you can go into more detail. But we've always been um, saying on theCUBE, if you try to force monetization right. in these emerging markets, you're optimizing behavior. And this was something that's gone on. We've seen containers, we've kind of, it's been well documented, obviously, what's, what's happened. It's certainly a beautiful thing. You got Kubernetes now on top, working together with that. If, as an entrepreneur out there that are building companies, if you try to force the monetization too early, you're really kind of thinking differently. You guys stayed true to it, and now we got a good home with Red Hat. Talk about that dynamic, because that, that was something that you, I know you guys faced at CoreOS, and you managed through it. Yeah. Tempted probably many times to do something. Talk about the mission that you had, staying true to that, and, the, and it's just that dynamic, it's challenging. Yeah, so as, as set out to build a company in general, there are really like three operating principles. There was build great technology to solve our mission, which is to secure the internet through automated operations. Uh, build a great place to spend our days, which is really about the people and the culture and so on, and you know, why do we do this? And the third was um, to make it sustainable. And by that I mean like, you know, build our own money fountain, spewing out of the middle of our campus. Um, and so, um, by joining Red Hat, it's like we just, you know, we have a money fountain <laughs> sitting there. It's yeah. spewing off a ton of cash flow every single quarter uh, that allows us yeah. to continue to do those first, uh, those first two things in perpetuity. And that third one is something every company needs in order to, you know, continue to execute towards a mission. And the thing that's so awesome about working with Red Hat is we're very much aligned and compatible. You know, Red Hat's mission isn't exactly uh, the same thing we are working on, but it is definitely compatible. It's like yeah. Apache and GPL are compatible, yeah. you know, it's like that, that type of compatible. Yeah, you, so, both, you both believe in open source in a big way. Talk about the Red Hat perspectives. Now you got like a kid in the candy store. OpenShift was made a big bet with Kubernetes. You see now you got the core OS. What, how has it changed in Red Hat internally 
things move around, obviously accelerates the game a bit for you guys, and you're seeing new life being pumped into OpenStack, you're seeing clear line of sight with on the Kubernetes on the app side, we were just at KubeCon, a lot of people are pretty excited. Right. You know, there's, there's clear lines of, of sight on what's de facto, what people are going to build around, and also differentiate. Right. So I'll start off by saying I really hope um, our CEO, Jim Whitehurst, doesn't see this interview. Oh. Because if he goes off and here's a money fountain and I'm going to go <laughs> go make budget problem? requests, <laughs> like, I think I know what's going I on. I think it's a balance sheet and cash flow statements <laughs> in the public filings, and I see a fountain of money spewing off the thing. The ability <laughs> to reinvest. This is in, a really good fit. <laughs> so the way to say it is that they have a great business yeah. model. Right, yeah, you great know. business Some of us will make money, some of us will spend the money. Right, <laughs> it'll yeah. work out well. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great win. I mean, it's a great win. Bob, yeah. it accelerates yeah. the plans. I mean, yeah. the, the, the commercial already there with Red Hat. This yeah. is just a good thing for everybody. <laughs> but the impact to you guys accelerates. You're seeing OpenShift. What's the, if you then boil it down to the impact to, uh, to Red Hat, what is the impact? So in all seriousness, I think uh, the, the focus for us really has been about, there is so much complementary work that's been going on with the Core OS team that we're bringing in to OpenShift and to Red Hat in general that accelerates everything that you're seeing. Um, you saw some amazing announcements happen this week, right, with regard to our partnership with Microsoft and getting OpenShift out on Azure as a joint and support offering. Um, the work we're doing with IBM to get uh, IBM middleware as well as IBM Cloud Private supported and integrated with OpenShift. Um, the work that Alex uh, referred to around automation, being able to bring that to our customers, we see a lot of excitement around that front as well. So we want to take all the tectonic uh, work that has been going on at, at uh, CoreOS, converge that into OpenShift, um, carry forward the community that uh, CoreOS built around container Linux, and actually inject a lot of those ideas into Red, Red, Red Linux, right? our flagship technology. Uh, bring that you know, passion and energy to bear there as well, uh, and then carry forward a lot of the other projects that they had. For example, uh, the Quay Container Registry is extremely popular, carry that forward, support our customers to use that both standalone, integrated with the OpenShift platform. Um, other projects like etcd that Alex has been talking about, uh, which is the underpinnings of um, Kubernetes clusters running worldwide. Um, so all of those things we can bring forward, and then all the advancements that were you know, made in place by CoreOS as they're working towards their money fountain, you know, just <laughs> plug that right into it. Right. And just as a, a point of reference, Brendan Burns flew in yesterday, yeah. Microsoft Build is going on, so he left their own conference come down here. That's a as real did Scott Guthrie, right? That's a great testament. Right. This is the testament. They're coming down, right. really laying down support. This is right. like a real big deal. It's not like a, a you know, fake deal, it's real. Agreed. Yeah. Yes, yes, I, I want to talk a little bit about specifics of the timeline and the roadmap. Sometimes with these mergers or acquisitions, right, it's like, well, the technology will be incorporated at some point and then you know, it goes away to die and you never see it again and then the people all leave and then you ask what, what was going on. But here you actually have, you, I was great, you were talking, we have some, actually some specific yes. timelines and we'll start to see some of the tectonic stack in OpenShift uh, yep. fairly soon. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So um, the acquisition was announced about three months ago. And we said at that time that by Red Hat Summit, we'll lay out for you um, a roadmap, and so we're now starting to do that. Uh, we put out you know, a release and some material um, around some details with regard to how that's coming out. Uh, we have detailed sessions going on at Red Hat Summit around you know, the integration plans between uh, Red Hat, OpenShift, and, and CoreOS. Um, but a few specific areas, um, you know, with regard to OpenShift, you'll start seeing the earliest versions, if you will, of the work that's being done. This summer, we'll deliver the full roadmap to you there by uh, the end of this calendar year. Um, with regard to, for example, pieces like uh, the Quake Container Registry, right, that's being made available and being sold now as we speak. Contain, uh, customers can go get that. Uh, and, and, and we want to make sure no customers left behind, right? That's a principle we put out. And with regard to supporting any existing customers on Tectonic or the Container Linux piece, we're doing that as we're working to integrate them into the Red Hat portfolio. Can you talk a little bit about the decision for uh, Red Hat's Atomic Host and, uh, and, and Container Linux, uh, now re renamed again CoreOS? Coro right. I mean, that was one of the, the seminal uh, inventions that you all made as you started the company. I, I think it had some brilliant ideas, again, about security and operational, uh, the operational aspects, but can you talk about some of that, those technologies and the decisions that made there? Yeah, so, you know, like I said, you know, the, the acquisition um, of CoreOS by Red Hat was about saying, look, what can we take that CoreOS has been doing to accelerate both work in the community, but also work that they've been doing uh, to, to deliver this technology to customers. Um, so the goal was, you know, we'll take Project Atomic and the work that, that's been going on there, have that be superseded by the work that's coming out of CoreOS Container Linux, carry the community forward, um, release a version of that called Red Hat CoreOS, um, and in its initial form, make that actually an underlying environment to run OpenShift in. 
right? So for customers who want the automation that Alex talked about earlier, um, you know, make that available both at the underlying platform, make it available in OpenShift, the platform itself, you know, via uh, the work that's coming from Tectonic, and then ultimately, Alex will talk about this some more, through operators. So trusted operations from ISV or, or third-party software that will run in the platform, right? So now, if you will, we'll have full stack automation, right, all the way through. OpenShift will also support RHEL, Red Enterprise Linux, you know, our traditional environment for the thousands of customers that we have globally. Um, over a period of time, you should expect to see much of the work that's going on in Red Hat CoreOS find its way into RHEL. So I think you know, there's just benefits all around you know, for us, both in the near term as well as long term. And Red Hat container certification, where does that fit into all this? Yeah, yeah great question. So what, you know, what we announced maybe it was two years, actually it was two years ago, you know, was a, a container certification program. Last year we, we, we spent some time talking about the health of those containers and being able to uh, provide that to, to customers, and this year we're talking about trusted operations uh, around those containers. Um, that carries forward. We've got hundreds of ISVs that have built you know, certified containers around it, and now with the operator framework, we've had, uh, I think it's four ISVs demonstrating uh, previews of their operators working uh, with our platform, as well as 60 more that are committed to building um, uh, ISV operators that will be certified against OpenStack. So people are excited in general, pretty much. I, I think we're very excited, right? The fact that we went to KubeCon last week, announced uh, the operator framework that's been based on the ideas that the CoreOS te uh, team has been working on for at least two years, uh, making that available to the community, and then saying for the ISVs that want a path to market, going yeah. back to the money fountain again, yeah. <laughs> for the ISVs that want a path to market, which yeah. is pretty much all of them, um, we also have an ability to do that. So give them an, uh, an opportunity to make sure they have as wide a possible yeah. uh, set of adoption of their software, at the same time help with commercialization. Can you guys share your definition of operator? Because I, you know, I saw the announcement, but we were in a little broader definition. When, when we see the DevOps movement going to the next level, it's all about automation, right? Yeah. And security, you mentioned that. Admin roles are being automated away. You're starting to see more of an operator function within en enterprise and emerging you know, service providers. So the role operator now takes on two meanings. It's a software developer, it also is a network right. operator, it's also a service So what is that, how do you guys view that role? Because if this continues, you're going to have automation, more administrative stuff, going to be self-healing, all this stuff's going to go on. The, essentially, operations is now the developers <laughs> and IT all kind of right. bl bl blaring together. How do you guys define the word operator in the, in the future Alex, state? you want to talk about that? I know that's yeah. an area of great yeah. interest to you. So operator is the term for the piece of software that implements the automated operations, okay? Yeah. And so automated operations, what is that? Well, that's, that's what sets apart, the way I think about it, it's what sets apart a cloud provider versus a hosting provider. It's that set of software that really you know, runs the thing for you. Um, and so, if we were to get into specific Kubernetes lingo, it would be an application-specific controller, <laughs> um, but it's a piece of software that implements the automated operations. And automated operations is a software that gives you that simplicity of cloud. You know, it's like, at the core of like a database as a service, it's both hosting, but also automated operations. Those two things together make up a cloud service, and that software piece is what we're decoupling from the hosting providers for the first time and allowing any open source project or ISV to bring the simplicity of cloud, but in any environment. And that's what the operator is, the piece of software that actually goes and implements that. So a microservices framework, this fits in pretty nicely. How do you see, you know, obviously. Yeah. Microservices yeah. is, you know, there's all these terms. Microservices is more of a architecture uh, than anything, but it's, it's saying, look, there's these basic things that every operations team has to go and do. You have to install something, you have to upgrade it, you have to back it up, you have to, when it crashes in the middle of the night, get it going again. A lot of these things, the best practices for how you do them are all common. I mean, there, there's no like ingenuity in it. And for those things, we can now, because of Kubernetes, write software that just automates it. And th right. this was not possible like five years ago. You couldn't write this software. Yeah. There were things like configuration management systems and, and stuff like that that would allow companies to sort of build their own custom versions of this. But to build a generic piece of software that knows how to run you know, an application like Prometheus or a database or so on, um, just it wasn't possible to write that. And that's what the first sort of four or five years of CoreOS was, was making it possible. That's why you saw all these yeah net new open source projects being built. But once it was possible, it's like, let's start leveraging that. And you saw the first operator come out about a year ago. Uh, I think it was our etcd operator was the first one, and where we kind of started talking about this as a concept. And now we're releasing operator framework, which is the 
the, the, from all the learnings of building the first couple, we now made it generic such that anybody can go and do it, and as part of Red Hat, we're now bringing it to the whole ISV ecosystem. So the whole plan to make automated operations yeah. ubiquitous is you know, still well underway. I'd love to extend that conversation though to the operator, the person, right? I think right. you and your team brought the, the perspective of the operational uh, excellence, right, to the, this, to the, to the to the table. Yeah. Uh, a lot of cloud has been driven uh, by, the, by the role of developer, right, and DevOps, but I've always felt like, you know, well wait a minute, operators, the, 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 the people used to, who used to be known as IT and sysadmin, they had a lot to bring to the table too about security and about, and about keeping things running and about compliance and about all that good stuff. Yeah. So um, can you talk a little bit, as, you've, as you see the community emerging and as you see all these folks here, how do you talk to people who want to understand what their role is going to be uh, yeah. with all this automation uh, in keeping, uh, keeping the clouds running? So computers used to be people too. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, we're not going to completely automate away everything because there, there's still parts of, of this wildly complex system that justifies whole conferences of thousands of people um, that require a whole lot of human ingenuity. What we're doing is saying, let's, let's not like do the part that is the fire drill in the middle of the night that keeps you from making forward progress. Right. Like the typical role of an operations person today is just fighting fires of mundane things that don't actually like add a lot of value to the business. In fact, being an ops guy is really difficult because yeah. you only get brought up when things are on fire. You never get any praise of when things are going well. Um, and so what we want to do is help the operations folks put out those fires, like the security updates, like let's just roll those out automatically. The way you do those across all organizations does not need to be special and unique, but they're really critical to do right. So let's just like automate that stuff away and let the operations team focus on moving the business forward. The parts that require like the human spirit <laughs> to actually go and do. And, and if we get to a point where a CEO of a company is like, wow, I cannot come up with a new business initiative because my operations teams are just so fast at implementing them, like then we'll know, then we have to start worrying about operations people's jobs, but I don't see that happening for a very long time. And, and no one's so going to be idle extend, either. No one's going to be sitting yeah. around twiddling their thumbs either. Let me just working. extend that point a little bit, right? Because the whole point of operators is to encapsulate human knowledge that ISVs have and bring that into the platform and automate it, right? So the, the, the challenge that we've had is an operations person is required to know a lot about a lot, right? So the question then really is, how can we at least take some of what's already known by people and be able to replicate that, yeah. right? And that allows for everyone to move forward. Yeah. I think that's just forward. Well, there's a bigger picture beyond that, so I agree. But there's also scale too. With cloud, you have scale yeah, sure. issues. So it would scale. <laughs> Automation is a beautiful thing because the fires also grow exponentially too, right? right? So you can't be operating, you know, like this. Exactly. Scale is matters. Right. Well, Super. The, right. the reason that this stuff was invented at Google initially was not because of Google's high query per second. It's that they were to build the application they were building required so many servers but you couldn't hire enough operations people without writing software to automate it. So they were forced to custom design the system because they had so many servers to run to build the software that they wanted to build. And, and other companies are just now getting to that point because every company's going through a digital transformation that they have to have like thousands of servers just to run their applications yeah. and there's no way you're just going to hire the operations staff to go and do it all by hand. You have to write software to turn the operations people into like mech warriors of running servers. You know, you well, need to like wrap them in automation uh, in order to scale them. Well, I interviewed Aparna at, uh, at KubeCon and she made a comment that all those operations folks at Google are software developers. Right, they're engineers, right, so software right, engineering. Right. So they're not ops guys just you know, right. pushing buttons and provisioning gear and whatnot. It's, they're actually writing code. We bring up the Google piece, the other piece that we heard at the KubeCon, we hear this consistently that this is now a new way to do software development. So what, what, when uh, a former Googler went out and went and worked for another company, left Google, she went in and she said, oh my God, they, you guys don't do you don't use Borg? Like, so she, to her, she was like, how do you write software? So right. she was like young and went out to the real world. It's like, wait a minute, you don't right. do this? So this is a new model in software development yeah. at scale <laughs> with these new capabilities. Right. I, I think so. And, and I think what's really important is the work we're doing with regard to an ecosystem perspective to help folks. So one of the top things I hear from customers all the time is, this sounds fantastic, everyone's talking about DevOps or microservices or, or, or any, you know, wanting to run Kubernetes at, at scale. Uh, do I have the skills? Can I keep up with the change that's in place, right? And how do I kind of you know, continue moving forward uh, around that? So, you know, we announced at Red Hat Summit, you know, managed offerings from let's say ATOS and DXC, right? Where you've got global system integrators, you know, helping folks or 
uh, companies like you know, Accenture T-Systems, the CEO came and spoke today about the work we're doing with them to, to help uh, connected cars, right? And those applications be, be rolled out you know, quicker and faster. So I think it's going to take a village, right, to, to get us to where we want to because the rate of change is so fast around all of these areas and it's not slowing down. Um, that you know, we'll have to ensure there's more automation and then there's more enablement that's going on for our customers. So, so there's some clarity. Can you guys comment on your reaction to, obviously we've seen OpenStack has done over the years and now with Kubernetes, well containers, now Kubernetes, you're seeing at least two ecosystems clearly identified. Application developers, cloud native, and then I would call under the hood infrastructure guys with OpenStack. Almost it, it, it kind of clarifies where people can actually focus on real problems that the communities need. So how has the container maturization of containers and Kubernetes clarified the role of the community? Because if this continues with automation, you could almost argue that the clarity happens everywhere. Can you comment on how you see that happening? Is it happening um, or is that just uh, uh, observation that's misguided? I think we're getting better with regard to um, fit for purpose or fit for use case, right? So if you start thinking about you know, the earliest days of OpenStack, OpenStack is going to be AWS in a box. And then you realize, well, that's not a practical way of thinking about you know, what a community can do, build, uh, and run for you at scale. And so the, when you start thinking about well, what are the appropriate use cases for this, now you start getting, if you will, you know, a set of skills, a set of expectations around how to make that successful. Um, I think we'll go through the same, if we haven't already been going through it, with regard to Kubernetes, right? So not every company in the world can you know, run and manage what I'll call you know, DIY Kubernetes, right? Though many companies will start with that. <laughs> And so the question is, you know, how do we sort of get to the point where there's balance around it, and then you know, be able to take advantage of you know, the work, for example, companies like Red Hat, you know, and what CoreOS was doing, to help accelerate that path. Because to the point Alex was trying to make, right, is the value for them being able to keep up with a quarterly release of Kubernetes, right, and every time a bug shows up to go off and be able to fix and patch it, and watch that, or is the value building the next set of you know, application services on top of the platform? That's great, well congratulations guys. Thanks for coming on theCUBE, appreciate the insight. Congratulations on the three months into Red Hat, good fit, um, and enjoy the rest of the show. Thanks for coming on, appreciate it. Yep. Live Thanks from Red Hat Summit, this is theCUBE's coverage here of Red Hat and all the innovation going on out in the open. We're here in the middle of the open the floor of Moscone West with live coverage. Stay with us for more after this short break. <laughs>